I'm Annie Laurie Gaylor. And I'm Dan Barker. We're co-presidents of the Freedom From Religion Foundation. Our guest today is the journalist and author, Catherine Stewart, to talk about the growing dangers of Christian nationalism and the importance of the secular vote in the midterm elections. The Freedom From Religion Foundation, which produces Free Thought Matters, is the nation's largest association of free thinkers, that's atheists, agnostics, and other non-believers. We invite you to join us in our vital work to keep our secular government free from religious influence. Become a member at ffrf.org or ask for a complimentary copy of our newspaper, Free Thought Today. Freedom depends on free thinkers. Watch prior episodes of Free Thought Matters on FFRF's YouTube channel. Catherine Stewart is a journalist and author whose books include The Good News Club, The Christian Right's Stealth Attack on America's Children, and more recently, The Power Worshippers, in, inside the dangerous rise of religious nationalism. She writes for the New York Times, the New Republic, the Washington Post, and is a leading authority on the politics of Christian nationalism, including writing a chapter for the joint report on Christian nationalism at the January 6th insurrection that was produced by the Freedom From Religion Foundation and the Baptist Joint Committee for Religious Liberty. So Catherine, welcome back to Free Thought Matters. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Nice to see you in person here, finally, in the studio. You're our first in-person guest since the pandemic for Free Thought Matters. Wow, that's so, amazing. Yes, that's we're honor. happy. So uh, we've been reading your books and watching your career, and reading your writings. You're, you're one of the early journalists and authors who was noticing this thing called Christian nationalism like way back, over a decade ago, warning about the dangers of Christian nationalism. You were not wrong, were you? You know, I've been following this movement for 14 years, and mm -hmm. one thing that I've learned is that we really need to listen to the movement leaders. They've been telling us for a long time that they want to tear down the separation of church and state. They want, they're taking aim at uh, many of our individual rights that many of us hold so dear. They um, reject the principles of pluralism and equality that represent the best of the American promise. They want to take back our schools and uh, bring our nation back to a sort of mythical time that never was. But uh, sometimes it's very difficult to actually hear what, what they're saying. I think a lot of times people reframe what they're hearing in order to make themselves more comfortable with it. But they've, um, they've been very clear. They're not hiding. It's just that we're not listening. But how did you come to realize that? I mean, way back when you were starting to write, how, how did this come to your attention that this was a problem? This really came to my attention through uh, discovering that something called a Good News Club was coming to my children's public elementary school. Uh, good News Clubs are after-school clubs targeting children uh, in their very earliest years of learning K through five or K through six, we're talking little kids here. A program, a uh, centerpiece of their program is called the Wordless Book. It's used to convert children who are too young to read. I into, used to do that when I was a Christian minister, just colors, right? Well, colors and shapes. Yeah. And it, it persuades children that they're gonna go to hell if they don't believe in a correct form of religion or if their families don't attend the right kind of church. So that's how, you know, I was really astonished to learn that there are thousands of these clubs in public schools nationwide. But the thing that really got me, a couple things. First is I, I thought, how is this possible given our constitutional principle of separation of church and state? And I started to look into the legal advocacy organizations that had sort of laid the groundwork for um, a very critical 2001 Supreme Court decision that enabled these clubs, which had been operating for years. and churches and homes and public parks and any of the other number of places that we're all free to practice our faith, if any. And all of a sudden, this, this uh, very sophisticated legal strategy 
uh, opened the doors to the public schools. And in fact, Good News Club leaders referred to public schools as mission fields hmm. and our children as the harvest. And yet they seem to treat public education as a whole with contempt and seem to really hate public education. And this all seemed quite sort of perplexing to me. So listen, kids, education, religion, it's a perfect storm. You know, I couldn't help but investigate further. And so you wrote a whole book about it, a lot of details on that. But to return to Christian nationalism, it is really having a moment now, finally, in, in the national media. We are getting attention paid to it, and we want to ask you about that. But first, we do want to show a clip that might have had something to do with that. I think Republicans really need to recognize uh, the people they represent, okay, their voters, not the, not the lobbyist donors, not the corporate PACs, not, not those people. That's not who the Republican Party should represent. Uh, we need to be the party of nationalism, and I'm a Christian, and I say it proudly. We should be Christian nationalists. Wow, we should say it publicly. They didn't used to say it that publicly, did they? They didn't. Margie Taylor Greene, of course. No, of course. And for a long time, you couldn't call this Christian nationalism whenever one did. The earlier writers, uh, many of whom I've uh, drawn upon in my own research, they were called alarmist. And uh, they said, this is a fringe movement. It's a movement that could fit into a phone booth, as George W. Bush's mm -hmm. former speechwriter put it. Um, mm -hmm. But hey, look, the phone booth moved into the White House in 2016. It refused to leave in 2020. And it turns out it's not a phone booth after all. It's stadiums. It's multiple stadiums all around the a country. A really big phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> this is a movement, frankly, that um, I think for many years the Republican Party thought it could make use of, and now it has taken over the Republican Party. And, you know, when we see clips like Marjorie Taylor Greene and some crazy stuff that she's saying, you know, everybody, it's like almost like a sideshow, and everybody's sort of, oh, look at that. But it would even be more important to see clips of sort of GOP powerhouses like Mitch McConnell or Kevin McCarthy sitting by and refusing to do anything when uh, former President Trump commits crimes or um, spreading lies about the stolen election, because it's those politicians, the sort of, you know, more powerful Republican leaders who have actually enabled this turn toward authoritarianism and religious nationalism in our politics today. And without their actions, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene would be just like the crazy sitting at the end of the bar. So people used to deny being Christian nationalists, and now we have public figures and officials embracing it. Now that is new. I mean, that's alarming, I think. That's true. And look, I think we need to define what Christian nationalism is and what it is not. First of all, it's yes. not a religion. It is not Christianity. It's um, the exploitation of religion for political purposes. And I think of it in two ways. On the one hand, it's an ideology, a set of ideas. Um, and on the other hand, it's a, an organized quest for power, political movement. So the ideology is anti-democratic. It ties the idea of America to a very reactionary understanding of the Christian nation, it says that's what makes us great rather than our um, our constitutional uh, democracy or are the principles of equality and pluralism that represent the best of the American promise or a long, if imperfect, history of an, uh, sort of absorbing many different people into our country and the rule of law and things like that, and says if we deviate from that mythical history, um, we're, we're doomed, right? It's very binary. It's sort of you're with us, you're against us. You're the pure versus the impure. And in terms of the organized quest for power, so that ideology really is the best tool. It's a f fantastic tool for directing, you know, folks to support that organized quest for political power. And that organized quest really includes a lot of infrastructure, right-wing policy groups, legal advocacy groups, uh, legislative initiatives, um, a vast sort of far-right messaging sphere, networking organizations like the Council for National Policy that get the leadership on the same page and get them together with a lot of the big ticket funders of the movement. So it's those two things. And, um, you know, I, I think we still see a lot of the definition focusing right now on the religious aspect or perhaps the sociological or cultural aspect of it. But this is not a culture war. We're really engaged in a political war over the future of democracy. But yet it does want to install a Christian theocracy. So 
it, what we would be left with is this perverted view of what Christian fundamentalism. Yeah, I think sometimes it's easier to see when it happens in other countries. So when you look at leaders like Vladimir Putin in Russia or Viktor Orban in Hungary, or when yeah. you look at Erdogan in Turkey, or if you look at uh, leaders in Iran, when they're binding themselves very tightly, these leaders, to ultra-conservative religious figures in their own countries, we rightly recognize this as religious nationalism, mm -hmm. and it's really done in order to consolidate autocratic power. Mm -hmm. The religion, it's almost like um, they're bubble wrapping themselves in sanctimony. They're saying, don't investigate any corruption because I'm a, I'm a holy man, right? And it, it, it ends up making it more difficult to investigate these leaders for, you know, corruption, for nepotism, cronyism. And, and any abuses they may be perpetrating against their own people. Some of the narrative, I remember when I was growing up in the church, uh, even though my family's Native American, we used to th believe that this country was founded as a Christian nation. The Puritans and the, they, you know, the true religious dissidents came over and set up the United States of America as a Christian nation. And that's part of the narrative today. Is that true? Absolutely not. Our founders proudly created the world's first secular republic. They did so deliberately, and they told us what they were doing as they were doing it. I think any good historian could demolish the sort of Christian nation myth in about 10 minutes. But the myth is so important to founders of this, uh, to leaders of this movement, that even as some of the folks who are promoting this myth, like David Barton, who's a, yeah. one of the movement's most sort of favorite pseudo-historians. Uh, his work has been discredited time and time again. One of his books was actually withdrawn by a Christian publisher, his own Thomas Nelson Publishing. They said it lacked uh, in matters of fact. And, but the uh, readers don't know that. They have those books on their shelves, and they pick it up, and they think that's the truth. I know. I yeah. would say that you could demolish the Christian nationalism narrative in about maybe 10 minutes, all you have to do is read our godless constitution, <laughs> which public, these public officials don't seem to have ever, you know, they take an oath of office like Marjorie Taylor Greene, and apparently they've never, they've never read it. Or they try to reinterpret it. Yeah. And um, unfortunately, we're seeing the consequences of this in our courts today. One thing the movement has done very consciously and deliberately is focusing on the courts. We have a, a grotesquely unrepresentative Supreme Court yes. as a consequence of this movement, this sort of um, legal infrastructure of the movement to organizations like the Alliance Defending Freedom, which has an annual budget of, I believe it's $102 million a year in fiscal year 2020 to 2021. Mm. Um, the Federalist Society, which has played an outsized role in shaping the courts by grooming and supporting candidates for uh, courts who have this so-called correct ideology. Um, Liberty and Council. Liberty Council, uh, uh, exactly. ACLJ. ACLJ. There are a number of these organizations. Pacific Justice Institute is a movement that's invested for years in legal advocacy because they recognize that a lot of their policies are really not popular with most Americans. I mean, for instance, a, a very solid majority of Americans support abortion rights. So they, that's just one example among many. So they know that if you can um, take the courts, you can actually enact the policies that you want, even if they go against what most people, what most people want. Most of those groups have the word liberty and freedom in it, you know, very American. When Orwellian. Or what they're trying to do is take away freedom. They want to impose their ideology on the rest of us. That's right. This is a movement that has taken aim at individual rights in a very big way. So when we come back from this break, we want to ask you, Catherine, something about abortion. Can we talk about Christian nationalism without talking about the Republicans? So we have a whole host of questions for you. Well, I also want to ask, what can we do about this? So we're talking with Catherine Stewart, author of The Good News Club and The Power Worshippers. We'll be back with more Free Thought Matters after this. Hi, I'm Ron Reagan, an unabashed atheist. When I first recorded that commercial back in 2014, being openly atheist in America was still fairly uncommon. Today, the fastest growing religious group in the country 
is the non-religious, especially among the young. That progress is heartening, but the religious pushback is fierce and the forces of Christian nationalism are well organized. Our progress won't continue unless we work together so that reason and our secular constitution will prevail. That's why I'm asking you to join the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest and most effective association of atheists and agnostics working to keep state and church separate, just like our founders intended. Please join the Freedom From Religion Foundation today. Ron Reagan, lifelong atheist, not afraid of burning in hell. My name is Bill and I'm an out-of-the-closet apatheist, meaning I don't really care what you believe and I don't really think that you should care what I believe. I was raised in South Dakota in a strict Catholic family. I was an altar boy. I served mass a lot of Sundays twice. We, the, the priest gave us this little card that said, in case of accident, please call a priest. I don't really like that idea anymore since I left the church about 40 years ago. Now, if you find me alongside the road after an accident, please call an ambulance and an EMT. And welcome back to Free Thought Matters. We're continuing our conversation with a journalist and author, Catherine Stewart. So Catherine, we haven't spoken to you since June 24th's decision by the Supreme Court, the Dobbs ruling overturning Roe versus Wade, and I'd like to get your uh, views on that, your reaction. Yes, well, um, the decision will make America more divided, more contentious, uh, and is bound to increase polarization because it goes against what so many, what most Americans want. And frankly, that instability is something that the, I believe the movement is after when a country seems less governable, it makes the uh, terrain ripe for an authoritarian reaction. Mm -hmm. So Alito's decision, just you know, looking at, at big picture, I think of it almost like three circles of harm. The first circle, of course, you have women and girls of childbearing age who will suffer the most immediate forms of harm uh, from not being able to determine their reproductive futures, uh, not being able to access maternity care, which they may need to preserve their lives or health. And the second circle, I think, is um, others who are sort of um, affected immediately by, by those decisions. But um, the third circle of harm is, is all of us who care about individual rights, yeah. who care about um, the legitimacy of the judiciary, who care about um, voting rights, the, the, the right to actually have our will uh, expressed through the democratic system. Um, it's, uh, it, in a way, what Alito has done is offer um, a master class in how to smuggle a, a kind of privilege right, privileges for a certain group and diminish the rights for the rest of us. Well, very well said. Um, yes, it is a great way to destabilize a country when um, half of the citizens of childbearing age don't know, can't control their future, for, for one thing. Um, so, uh, as a journalist uh, watching the rise of Christian nationalism, uh, what, what's next? What, what should we expect? Well, this is a movement that, I mean, I think with the Roe decision, uh, they're just really getting started. The, if you read the decision itself, it makes clear that they're going after the right to privacy, they're going after a whole host of rights that they don't agree with. But that's only the, like half the work of this sort of radical Supreme Court. Depriving individuals who they disfavor and groups that they disfavor of rights is, is one part of it. But the other favor, uh, part of it is actually offering privileges to groups that they, they do prove of. So in the Roe decision, uh, Alito says, you know, if something wasn't, uh, right wasn't established and whatever it is, 1868 or whatever, then, you know, it's not guaranteed in the Constitution. But yet he's found all kinds of rights, has no trouble finding rights, he and other right-wing justices that are nowhere in the Constitution. Uh, nowhere in the Constitution does it said that uh, 
churches have a right to direct public funding or religious schools have a right to be funded by mm -hmm. the taxpayer. Nowhere in the Constitution does it say that individuals have a right to own an AK-47. Um, there are so many rights that they've found, or corporations, certain rights they've found for corporations. But this is what religious nationalism does. It identifies an in-group in society and an out-group, the pure versus the impure. And it sort of reminds me of something that I heard at the last Road to Majority conference, which I attended, a former President Trump spoke, and he said, the greatest enemy, and I'm paraphrasing a bit here, is, the greatest enemy is not our foreign adversaries as, you know, as bad as they may be. The greatest enemy we face is the enemy from within. And this is an, a talking point that I've heard echoed by many right-wing and religious nationalist leaders who are using religious nationalism to divide and therefore consolidate authoritarian forms of political power. Well, and how ironic is it that they are the danger from within? Hmm. Well, the I irony is they're the danger to true religious freedom. True religious freedom, as we all know, is the freedom to worship any god or sacred idea or none. It's the freedom to believe or not to believe as you choose. It's also including the freedom from being compelled to worship if you don't want to, uh, and the freedom from being compelled to support any religion if you don't want to with your tax dollars. That's right. But in the hands of um, these uh, folks, the idea of religious freedom has been completely reframed and, frankly, um, distorted. Well, when they say the greatest enemy we face, what do they mean by we? They're talking about white Christians, basically. We're being threatened by these hordes of minorities and non-religious people who are attacking as if we the people wasn't all the people. Well, it's not all Christians, for sure, and yeah. it's not all white people, for sure. Yeah. So, for instance, uh, the movement uh, is including many evangelicals, but it excludes many evangelicals, too, and it includes representatives of a variety of both Christian and non-Christian, Protestant and non-Protestant religion, and even derives support from some people who don't identify as Christian at all. The movement is also, I think, um, the, the race politics are very complicated. Uh, the movement draws on a tradition that was very explicitly racist, but in recent years, the movement has made efforts to cultivate um, certain uh, religious leaders of color in order to get some subsection of their congregations to vote for candidates that the movement favors. They're, I believe, very sensitive to accusations of racism, so they want to cultivate the appearance of diversity, but they have had some success among some communities of color. So, briefly, uh, we're being told, and you believe, that Christian nationalism is not a fringe group, but I don't think the public has caught on yet. And why isn't it a fringe group? Well, we can look at its influence in terms of our t politics. I mean, this is a movement that, for many years, I think, as I mentioned earlier, the Republican Party thought they could make use of, because they delivered a reliable slice of the votes. But now, this movement, by investing for decades in this infrastructure, has seized control uh, of the Republican Party. And my belief, uh, I believe we don't hear how many Republican politicians are compelled to embrace extreme views, because they know if they fail to do so, they will be primaried by uh, this movements like some of their organizations. So, for instance, I attended this past year's National Pro-Life Summit in Washington, D.C., and I heard uh, some of the leaders of groups like Students for Life of America talk about, oh, if we don't, if Republican politicians who call themselves pro-life but aren't embracing the policies that we want, you know, if they're not embracing those policies, we're going to devote these efforts to mounting primary challenges and talking about the money and the man and woman power that they would use to mount the, those primary challenges. I mean, that's a big threat. So I think there are very few Republican politicians today who can succeed without doing much of what this movement wants. There might be some wiggle room around the edges, but uh, not too much. In the two minutes we have left, what can we do about this threat? You know, I think about the... <laughs> A couple of the figures that I'm so fascinated by in this movement, Ralph Reed, who said, pay no attention to the polls, our numbers are shrinking, all that matters is who turns out on election day. And he's right. 
There is no substitute for the power of the vote. But there's so much more we can do. This is a movement that never forgets that much of politics is local. Look at the sort of way they're activating local communities through these new culture wars in in public schools. So um, it's really important to get involved in your local community, whether it's the schools, your local court, your local uh, you know, town hall. Uh, pay attention to what's happening in the courts. Invest in the infrastructure of democracy. Protect the right to vote, because they're coming for that in a very big way. And then, besides voting, besides um, being aware, uh, I mean, you, we need to uh, call attention to this in other ways. I mean, as individuals, wh what can an individual do? We have to remember that we, those of us who reject the politics of, of, of division and conquest are the majority, and we need to uh, recognize that, you know, we have the power, we need to use it. Uh, and uh, we need a very big tent. It's a very big, noisy democracy. We're not all going to get everything we want, and that's okay. It's like a big, crowded family, and you know, maybe you want a pony and you don't get it, right? <laughs> but but we can come together, and and be unified when necessary, in the moments when necessary, and um, you know, allow one another to have some differences, but come together when necessary and recognize the importance of the vote and recognize that um, it's not always about the front runner. Sometimes it's about court appointees. Sometimes it's about who are they going to appoint to run uh, various divisions of government, people who want to tear those divisions down or people who actually want to invest in and improve our country. People are going to have contempt for the law or people who are going to respect the rule of law in our Constitution. Well, and it certainly is gratifying to see many more religious people um, publicly speaking out against Christian nationalism. That, that's also a welcome change. Well, there's so much more to talk with you about. Catherine, mm -hmm. it's been enlightening and fascinating and so nice to see you in person. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, and thank you for watching Free Thought Matters. Because Free Thought Matters. I'm Steve Pinker. In my book, Enlightenment Now, I show that the world has become a better place as reason has been overcoming superstition and tribalism. But the values of the Enlightenment are under attack. That's why I'm a proud member of the Freedom From Religion Foundation, the nation's largest association of free thinkers working to keep state and church separate. Please join me in supporting the Freedom From Religion Foundation to ensure that our government is driven not by religion, but by reason.